I first of all want to thank you for allowing me to be with you this evening. It's certainly my privilege to be able to be here. I also want to commend this congregation upon their faithfulness. And from time to time things happen, as you well know, and we don't know everything there is to know about some individuals, but when we find out that perhaps they're teaching a false doctrine, to act upon that is very important. And so we appreciate that so very much and appreciate you for that. I, if I had accepted an invitation, I would not have been able to be with you this week because the North Lexington Church of Christ in Lexington, Kentucky called a couple of months ago and wanted to know if I would come down and take part in their Cane Ridge meeting this year. I've done that a time or two. I've been down there and I think it was Dwight Duncan asked me a while ago if I had been to Lexington, Kentucky, to the cemetery and Cane Ridge and all that uh, a a few times, Dwight, and um, was able to preach in the old Cane Ridge building down there where Barton Stone and uh, those individuals actually started a congregation there in that area. Our study tonight is on what you would call church history and does the church or do we still need restoration or something like that? I knew where I was going regardless of the title. (laughs) (laughs) But the fact is that the church, I want to say this first of all, there are essential concepts concerning the church and restoration. I need to define, first of all, Reformation and Restoration. When you talk about Reformation, that means going back and fixing an already existing, maybe church or organization or something such as that. That is what Martin Luther wanted to do when he nailed the 95 Theses upon the Wittenberg door. When he wanted to change, when he wanted to reform the Catholic Church not do away with it, but reform it. And how many times has the Catholic Church been reformed? Over and over and over and over, and I could continue all night in saying that. We're not out to reform the Lord's Church. As a matter of fact, you and I are not going to restore the Lord's Church. You know why? It's already restored. If the kingdom of God, if the church is not restored, then you don't have salvation. If the church is not restored, then you're not worshiping properly. If the church is not restored, then you don't have the proper organization. If the church is not restored, then you and I are lost. And that's a very sad state of affairs when we think about that. So when I talk about restoration, I'm talking more of a repentance movement. The church has never gone out of existence. It's always been here in the Bible, in the Word of God. Now there have been people, there have been congregations, there have been many, many individuals that have strayed from the truth. And I thought about bringing a, my notes tonight concerning different areas in which the church through the years in the beginning had strayed from the truth, but we don't have all night. And so I didn't go there. But what, rather, what I chose to do, I chose to say that you and I are members of the church of Christ that began on the day of Pentecost. And if the church did not begin on the day of Pentecost, anything before Pentecost and anything afterwards that was established is not the Lord's church. And those that say, well, the church started in the days of John the Baptist. Don't you know that, Bill? No, I do not know that. Because the Bible doesn't teach that. John the Baptist did not start a church. As a matter of fact, what did he say? You know as well as I, I'm not even worthy to tie the shoes of this man that comes here to me to be baptized. Now, I paraphrase that. But the fact is, that's what John the Baptist said. But yet many people go back and they say, well, I'm a member of that church. If you are, then you're a member of the church that 
came about because before Jesus ever died and was resurrected. You're a member of a church in which man made because Jesus had not been coronated at that time. He had not gone to be seated at the right hand of God. And so therefore, I guess the statement is that when you and I talk about restoration, we have to talk about a repentance movement. Now, what I want to say is this, that each and every one of us as individuals need to restore our lives to New Testament Christianity. And congregations need to restore their lives and their existence according to the restoration. Now, to restore something means to go back to the original and make it exactly I mean exactly as the Bible describes it. The logical consequences, if we do not do that, is that we simply become a denomination. The Restoration Movement actually began with New Testament writers, not not Thomas and not Alexander Campbell. Now these were good men, they were great men, they were men that you and I can look to and We can appreciate a lot about them. But I have to establish this fact that they are not our spiritual fathers. These are not the individuals that we follow. These are not the people that we go back to and say, well, I'm going to follow Alexander Campbell. I'm going to follow Thomas Campbell. These are not people that we are to follow. Matter of fact, they wouldn't have that. They wouldn't want that. I want you to notice it really began with the writers of the New Testament in our epistles. You have your Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you'd look at that. There is, and Jesus spoke it before this. But the Apostle Paul said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meat, which God hath created to receive with thanksgiving of them which believe and knoweth the truth. And so therefore there was the idea there is a departure. And when there is a departure, what needs to happen? What do you expect of someone, for example, if they teach a false doctrine and they're taught differently than what they're teaching that is against the Bible. You, you expect them to repent. What happens when you and I sin? We go into the world. And we're confronted with that sin, with the Bible, with our scriptures, first of all, and with the brethren, secondly. Then you and I are expected to do what? We're expected to repent. And so therefore, when we notice ourselves as the Lord's people drifting away from the New Testament pattern from that which the church is one and was established on the day of Pentecost, when we drift from that, we need to come back to it. And so there is what restoration is all about. People have a wrong concept sometimes. They think it is just men. They think it's just individuals that we talk about and we have our thinking about. But really, stop and think about it. When you talk about the seven churches of Asia, what was John talking about? He was talking about those churches doing what? Coming back to the pattern. Coming back, existing as God wanted them to exist, to live and to act and conduct themselves in the way that He chose for them to do. In other words, He said, do what? Repent. To the church at Ephesus, repent, or I'll take away from you the candlestick. He told them many, many ways. So there is a pattern for the church to follow, and there has been that pattern in every age. And I believe we can prove that there has been the church that existed, and it might be a small remnant, but there have been groups that have met and groups that have come together, and they have lived, they've conducted themselves, they have existed as the Lord's kingdom ever since the day of Pentecost. And so when you and I think about restoration again, we have to think about that church which was established on Pentecost, which has always been. And you and I can pick up the Word of God today. And we can read it, we can study it, we can know what we need to do to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and belong to that church. Number one reason God adds us 
If you look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 and verse 47, the scriptures teach there that God adds us to the kingdom. But suppose, just suppose that you and I have drifted. Suppose there are those people that have drifted, and that's a truth. There are those that drift, and there were those that have drifted. And denominations sprang up because of that. And individuals were led off into denominationalism. And they were led off into cults. And they were led off into different religious organizations. And too many, and too numerous for us to even think about tonight or try to even number. I, I can't even number them. And so we need to think about that. So there needed to be a restoration. We can go back for an example of restoration to the Old Testament. To a young boy, eight years old, Josiah. And if you go back to 2 Kings chapter 22, notice there in verse 1, Josiah was eight years old when he became the king and reigned 31 years. Now here you have an eight-year-old child, as you and I would call them. In verse 2, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And walked in all the way of David his father, and turned not aside to the right hand nor to the left. As a young man, he didn't turn to the right nor to the left. In other words, he strayed, stayed on the straight and the narrow. Following after that, which God would have to have him to follow after. In Second Kings chapter 23 and verse 25, we are told that he turned to the Lord with all of his heart. But what did he do? As a young man, what did he do? At 16 years of age, he purged idolatry from his country. And you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 34 and verse 3. And it talked about this young man. And you talk about young people today. Do we have young people with this type of conviction? Boy, I hope we do. Because we need those young people. We need them to stand up and to be counted. Not for us as grown-ups saying, oh, let them go sow their oats and we'll, one day they'll come back and they'll do this or that. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. But the fact is, they are responsible even at this age. And here we have this young man. We have King Josiah. And the Bible said he purged idolatry. What does that mean? He went down and he tore down. Those places that man had created with his own hands. The idols that they had carved out of stone. The idols that they had made with wood. <clears throat> and the idols that they had dreamed up in their own mind. That they ignorantly went forth and they worshipped. But it wasn't only in the Old Testament. It was in the New Testament. Remember in Acts chapter 17 in Mars Hill. Where the Apostle Paul went into a community. And there he saw there an erection of all types of monuments to different gods. And then he proclaimed unto them the God of heaven, Jehovah God. He restored, Josiah restored the Passover in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 21 through 22. And the king commanded, notice it says, all the people saying, keep the Passover unto the Lord your God as it is written in the book of this covenant. And that's what I plead for today. And that's why you are pleading people and wanting them to do is to keep the book. To keep the laws that are written in the book of the law of the covenant. Now you and I live under a different covenant. The old covenant's been fulfilled. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. The old covenant has been fulfilled. You and I live under a new covenant. And that is the New Testament. The early church is clearly a model for us that we might remain steadfast and that we might remain and do those things which God would have us to do. Another thing about these individuals that we're going to talk about just a little bit is that they were not people. For example, you take Thomas Campbell. Some people say by accident, some people say because of anger, some people say because he was a man that wanted to rebel against his Presbyterian church. But in 1806-7, when he came to America, and he left his homeland in Scotland, and he came to America, and when he arrived here, he went to the Synod in the New York area. 
And he asked them for a writ because he wanted to go preach among the different congregations. And they questioned him on some things. They they sat him down, they questioned him, and they asked him if he was going to live by the Westminster Confession of Faith. And Campbell, right away, Thomas that is, he, he was an educator. And it's been said that Thomas Campbell was the architect and Alexander Campbell was the one that was the builder. And I believe that to be certainly a truth from a certain standpoint. But Thomas Campbell was one that said, you know, he said, I have been praying, I've been thinking, I've been studying, I've been reading on my journey here to America. And I believe that I should have freedom to go preach the Bible, the Word of God, not from the Westminster Confession of Faith, but the Bible. And so right then and there, they refused. They would not give him his license, so to speak, that he might preach in America. Well, he went and he preached anyway. As a matter of fact, he wrote the Declaration and Address, which I do not have time to go through all of that, as you well know. But there's one great statement that came out of that Declaration and Address that Thomas Campbell wrote. Now, Alexander Campbell's been credited with saying it, but really it was Thomas Campbell. That wrote it. And as he wrote and as he told them that he had no choice but to go and to please God, that he had no choice but to go and to do what God would have him to do and to preach the way that God wanted him to preach. And he came up with a slogan, and you and I look at that today, and I think it's a pretty good slogan. The Bible said it before he said it. And the Bible said, don't add to or take away from anything God said. That's exactly what he meant. But he said, where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible is silent, we're silent. And that's a pretty good thing. That's a thought. And when he said that, they they were inflamed. And they literally put him out of the Presbyterian church. Well, in another part of the world where he had left his family, where he had left his family still in Scotland, and as they boarded the Hibernia, the ship Hibernia, And as they began their journey to America, they got to Glasgow, and the ship there wrecked upon the rocks. And as that ship wrecked upon the rocks, they could not repair it. They couldn't get passage to another ship for a year. And so Alexander Campbell, who is Thomas Campbell's son, and his mother and his sisters and his other brother, Alexander said, I might not just waste my time here. I might as well go to school and learn something. And so he went to the college, as you and I would call it, of Glasgow. And while he was there, he wanted to attend and he wanted to worship there. But he had to go through that same examination as his father had to go through. And so they called him before the board because he wanted to take what they call communion. And the only way you would be able to take communion is if you were given a coin. And that coin represented, and he went to those that were offering communion on the first day of the week or once a month, once a year, whatever they did. And you would hand them that little token. And that meant you were accepted by the board so you could take communion. You and I know this is all wrong. We know that goes against Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. We know that that is not correct. But when you're raised up in a denomination such as he was, he didn't really know it at that time, but he was there. And as he stood before this board, they asked him questions. They they wanted him to make statements. And again, they confronted him with the Westminster Confession of Faith. Well, in the school he was going to in Glasgow, he ran into the Haldane brothers. I don't know if you've heard of them or not. But they were young men. They were young men that were really diligently studying the Bible. And they had convinced Alexander Campbell that, you know, no one can deprive you or keep you from partaking of the Lord's Supper or communion. And they are two brothers that said, you know, something else as far as the instrument is concerned, we see no authority for that. 
And they say, not even that. We are to come together upon the first day of the week. And we are to worship God. And they pretty much had down everything. Not everything, but they pretty much had down what they needed to do on the first day of the week. And so Alexander Campbell, he finally got his coin. The first day of the week came. He went to the church building there, as he would call it. And he waited in line. And as he waited in line, as he stood there waiting for communion to be offered, he was thinking in his mind, Who is man? Who is man that I must obey him? Who is man that I must get permission from him to take the Lord's Supper? And when he finally got before these men that one would offer the bread and one would offer the fruit of the vine, And when he got there and he got ready to offer them his coin, he took that coin and he tossed it down in a plate. And we can hear it still ringing today. And he made this statement, I will not adhere to the doctrines of men. And he turned and walked away. Now someone says, no, he didn't have all the truth then. He necessarily did not. But then in 1809, 1808, excuse me, he came to America. He finally got here. And he thought, when I get to America, my father is really going to be upset with me because I have rebelled against the Presbyterian church. When he got here, his father came. They met together on the road as they had left and they were traveling and he was going to meet them. They met on the road. And they had a meal together. And Alexander was very nervous. And he said, Father, I need to talk to you about something. And finally, that evening, after they ate their meal, they gathered together. And Alexander said, I have left the Presbyterian Church. And Thomas Campbell said, I have been kicked out (laughs) of the Presbyterian Church. And so they got to studying the Scriptures together and they traveled on to what you and I now would call, as far as you and I know, Pennsylvania. And then they spread over into the Virginia and then later on West Virginia. And that's where they took up their residence. And they traveled throughout the country studying the Bible. And then eventually there came to this point to where Alexander Campbell had a child. And how did he come up with the idea? Well, he said, I need to do something with this child. Shall I sprinkle this child? Shall I baptize this child? What shall I do with this child? Because I know I want her to go to heaven. He said, I'll study. And if you've ever been to Bethany, West Virginia, and you've ever been there and you've seen his study, it's a octagon type of little study, not very big. You could about touch any wall sitting in one place. And I was able to go in there. My wife talked to the people and begged them to let me in. They did. I stood behind Alexander Campbell's pulpit where he stood there and studied all day long. And she took a picture of me. Lo and behold, the thing was so dark you couldn't really see it. But it's me. It's me. (laughs) And I just felt smarter standing there. But Alexander Campbell went into his study and he did so for three months. Came out to eat. Came out late at night to sleep. But then he went and he wrote a book on baptism. That book is about that thick. And he realized I need not baptize this or sprinkle this baby. But what do I need to do? I myself need to be baptized. And he went and he discussed this with his father. They studied. He he discussed it with his sister and her husband. They studied. And so here's the big question that a lot of people ask. Well, does it really matter who baptizes you? And Campbell said, well, he didn't really know. But he knew one thing, that he needed to be baptized. His father said, I know I need to be baptized. His sister said, I know I need to be baptized. And another couple that was of that local church there where he went said, we know we need to be baptized because he taught it. And they understood it and they come to the Bible. And they called a Baptist preacher called Matthias Luce. 
and ask him if he would baptize them. And he said, I'll baptize you into the Baptist church. And they said, no, that's not good enough. Here's what we want you to say. Here's what we want you to do. And so finally he consented and they were baptized in the Buffalo River just below the house where Campbell lived. That was the beginning. And then he established the Redstone Church, as they called it. It wasn't long after that he made some real enemies. He started what was called the Christian Baptist. Now the logic behind the name of that I never could understand, but yet at the same time he was a Christian and he wanted to be show and he didn't want to offend the Baptist. And he was kind of a mellow person, Alexander was at that time, and he said, well, if I don't offend the Baptist, then I can take the Christian Baptist and distribute this among them. And maybe I can get them to understand and maybe they will begin to believe what the Bible teaches and we can study with them. I don't necessarily agree with the title of his paper, but yet, if you have access to any of it, which I think you can get some of it online, I have a set of those and uh, I read them quite often. But the fact is that every article in them he was going back to New Testament Christianity and restoring in his life and teaching that to those around in his community. He became hated. People didn't like him. But news of that traveled on to other men such as Barton Stone in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, to Walter Scott also, who at that time was in Kentucky, and and to other individuals that began to go back to the New Testament. And they began to go back and congregations began to pop up all over the country. And what were they preaching? They were preaching New Testament doctrine. And they were going back and they were studying and doing what God would have them to do. Now you might be sitting here tonight saying, I don't want to waste my time hearing about those men. Well, it can be a waste of time, but we have to lay the groundwork. Because after all, you and I, these are not our spiritual fathers. I do not claim that they are. But they do have my respect in the sense that they follow the Scripture as you and I follow the Scripture. But when they came together and they established, as a matter of fact, when Barton Stone and eight other individuals left, the denomination they were in, and they said, and they drew themselves away from it. And said, we can no longer participate in this heathen worship. And they signed a piece of paper saying that to effect. And then they went over and they started another group. And eventually they came and they said, you know something? We're not doing any better than they are because what have we done? <coughs> we have just started another denomination. And they said, we'll renounce that. We'll renounce that. And then their intent went like this. We are not claiming to. We will not go back to and restore or try to accept and establish another denomination. That's a statement directly from them. And each and every one of them signed it. You might say, well, what does that mean to me today? I don't know, to be honest with you. But I think that if you look back, we will find that as we look to these men, we do owe them a debt. Because they had the courage to stand forward. They had the courage to preach what the Bible preached. I'm not saying there were not individuals all over the world doing the same. Because in England, it can be proved that they were. There were those that were preaching the gospel of Christ. And they were doing that before Campbell ever came to America, before he had ever even been heard of or before he was born. But yet, at the same time, we do owe them a debt. Barton Warren Stone, along with 14 other churches, succeeded and split from the Presbyterians with the basic difference being that they claimed the right to interpret the Bible regardless of the creed that the Presbyterian church had. That's the first thing that has to happen. 
I wish some of our brethren today that are supposedly preachers and teachers would have that same content in their brain. And they would think, I'm going to stop preaching just what I claim to be or what we think to be the old Church of Christ doctrine and I'm going to preach the Bible. There's still a lot of people preaching what they call Church of Christ doctrine, you know, which is not Bible sometimes. But we need to come back and preach the Word of God. Every Sunday here, I don't doubt that you have Don, you have Michael, you have different ones in the audience here tonight that are preaching the Word of God. And this is what needs to take place. Well, when you and I think about men such as Bart Warren Stone, when we think about Walter Scott, when we think about Thomas and Alexander Campbell, these are the big four, they call them, in the Restoration. I was asked a while back who I thought, foolish question, that someone asked me, this really truly was a foolish question. Someone said, Bill, who do you think is the greatest preacher in the brotherhood? I said, well, me, of course. <laughs> no, I did not. But what I did say is, you know, I probably don't know his name. But it's probably some fellow out here somewhere that we don't know. Someone maybe off in the woods that you and I don't know of that's preaching in a small congregation. Maybe just a few people. Maybe even just meeting with his family. But he's doing the very best from his heart and studying the Word of God and preaching the Word of God. To me, that is the greatest preacher in the Lord's church. Those individuals that was willing even to die and to have their blood shed so they could preach the gospel of Christ. Let's come to Missouri, or Missouri, however you want to call it. And let's look at some of the men that were here that encouraged us. And some of the men, and like I said, I'm not putting these people up on a pedestal at all but just giving you information. You go, you look about them, you think about them, whatever you like. But up toward where the airport is now, there's a place called Plattsburgh. There's an old log church up there. It still stands to this day. And there was a preacher there named Augustus H.F. Payne. And Augustus H.F. Payne was from Kentucky. He had moved with his family to Missouri. And he was a gospel preacher. And it so happened he was preaching during the Civil War. And as he was preaching the gospel of Christ, many people were being baptized. And all of a sudden they came in, they said, you'll no longer be able to hold meetings. You can't gather. Because they were fearful that people were going to turn against them, the North, and that they were going to join the forces of the South or something, I guess. But there was such a thing as a Missouri Oath. I don't know if you know about this or not, but most of the preachers in the church in Missouri signed an oath that they would not take sides with the North or the South. All they wanted to do was preach the gospel. That's as far as I'll go with my opinion on that. But the fact is that Augustus H.F. Payne told them, he said, I will meet. I will perform marriages. I will meet with the people on the Lord's Day. I will study with groups. They will study with me. I will not adhere to your teaching. And they said, you will or else. And I guess it was else because one day they found his body in a ditch not far from his home. They actually proved. They knew who killed him, who put him to death. And when his family came out looking for him, they found him the side of what you and I would call a road. And his horse sort of wandering around there. And his family said, can we take him home? Can we bury him? They said, yes. And so they watched those people and they said, he'll not go to the cemetery, but you'll have to take him home. So they took him home, buried him in the front yard. During that period of time, they... As they said, they wanted no gatherings. And so, after the Civil War, then his body was taken into Plattsburgh, and there he was buried, and they gave a proper funeral, as you and I would call it, and erected a tombstone there to him. We don't hear about men 
like that, do we? We don't hear much about them at all. We don't hear about men such as those that are going to rebel against and say, we'll follow God rather than man. You have the Moses Large who came from Kentucky also as a young boy who moved up north also in Platte County and up there as his father died from smallpox and his mother, who having three other children was so poor that she could not even feed her sons, Moses Lard being 15 years of age, not known for anything, not much of anything, not a Christian yet, not knowing anything about Christianity much. But Moses' large mother comes to him and she says, you know, we don't have enough food for the children to eat. And Moses and his brother, who was only one year older than he, they said, we will leave home, we'll go to work. And then their mother wrapped her arms around them and sent them away from home. But as they got ready to leave, she grabbed them and she put in their hand a small Bible. And she said, take this. It will lead you where you need to go. And by campfire at night, as they camped out in the woods, as they hunted for their food, as they strived to go about and make a living for themselves, to find where they could even bring some back to their mother and the little children that were at home, they read the Bible by firelight. And they read there where they needed to obey the gospel, and they found it. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but they read, they found it, and they decided we need to obey the gospel. And they went and they obeyed the gospel. And a man named Allen, T.M. Allen, who lived in the Columbia area, who was out on a mission trip, who many, many years older than them, was able to help them and teach them further what they needed to know and baptize them into Christ. Kind of reminded me of Philip and the eunuch. I don't know about you, but that's the way it's done. And as you know, Moses Lord became a great preacher in the, in the Lord's kingdom and established many congregations. We could talk about J.W. McGarvey. We could talk about T.M. Allen. We could talk about many, many individuals. But let's talk about us. Let's talk about where we're at tonight, what we will do. Would we go through what these men went through? They were driven from homes. People hated them. Because they were turning against the tide. They were going against the denominations. And one night, when Campbell actually was coming home from a debate in Steubenville, Ohio, with a man called Sidney Rigdon. Does that ring a bell? Sidney Rigdon defected. He went back to the world. He went to a cult. He left the Lord's kingdom and followed a man called Joseph Smith. And of course, Joseph Smith was supposed to have found those golden tablets walking in the woods one day when he saw a white salamander crawling in a hole. And lo and behold, the angel showed him the word of God. What what are we told in the word of God? Though an angel from heaven... (laughs) Teach any other gospel, let him be accursed. But Sidney Rigdon, like I said, oh, I I can hang on to Joseph Smith. He's going somewhere. And he helped him, so-called, interpret the Bible. You know, they come up with the Book of Mormon. That's what they come up with. And it's kind of strange the way they use King James language, you know. It's kind of a strange thing. But anyway, that's another story in another sermon, which maybe we'll have time for in my three hours. But there were those types of men. But Moses Lard was baptized and went throughout Missouri and he established many, many congregations. Not far from here is Lexington, Missouri, where a congregation was established there. If you've been to the courthouse in Lexington and you go right straight down the street, you'll see a church that sits on the corner. It's called the Second Baptist Church. I don't know, maybe some of you have been there with me or not. I don't remember. And my children have. Son, there he'd been all over the country with me. He he was miserable. Dad, we're about there. Dad, we're going to quit. Dad, I'm getting sugar bit. Dad, 
You know, we went through all of that, all the kids. And if you go and look on that building, that is where the church was. That's where the church met in Lexington from 1838 until 1860s. You've heard of John T. Johnson. Preached his last sermon there. He got off the riverboat, came up to the building there, and as Alan Wright was preaching, John T. Johnson walked through the door and he said, Lo, Brother Johnson, come take the pulpit. And he come, he took the pulpit, and he preached what was called a protracted meeting. And you know what that was? Don, you know, don't you? That meant as long as people had come, he'd want to preach. It wasn't Sunday through Wednesday. <laughs> it might be through August through November. And that's exactly what it was. And John T. Johnson caught pneumonia there that winter and died there in Lexington, Missouri. They put him in a holding grave, as they called it, until spring, took him up and took him back to Lexington, Kentucky, and buried him there. But these are the type of men we're looking at that helped you and me. So we owe them a great debt. But here's our challenge. What are we going to do for our young people in the future? Are we going to stand firm? Are we going to stand fast? Are we going to stand up and say it doesn't matter what any government says? And believe me, it may come. It would not surprise me. And I won't get on that roll tonight. But the fact is, you and I are going to have obstacles to fight I may not. I'm 70 years of age. Leland's older than I am. I know that. <laughs> He's still got hair, though. I... But we've got battles to fight. You, you folks here fighting them. You folks here have eliminated a perhaps false teacher from coming even this week. You're fighting the battle. But you've got work to do because our young people, these young people that are sitting here in these pews, need to be a great priority. In every congregation. Moms and dads need to pay attention and listen and teach their children at home and raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Do the very best you can. Doesn't mean a guarantee, but it means that you and I have that work to do. It means that when we come together, every opportunity we have to learn from the Word of God, we need to learn something from it. I always say to the congregation where I preach, be a better Christian today than you were yesterday. Be a better one tomorrow than you are today. And there's only one way of doing that. That's going back to the Word of God and restoring in your life New Testament Christianity. Which one of us here that is adult has not fallen? Which of us has not gone astray? Which of us has not made mistakes or sinned? I think none of us can raise our hand because I have. I've always had to come back to the Word of God, but I'm not going back to the Westminster Confession of Faith. I'm not going to the Doctrine and Covenants. I'm not going to the Book of Mormon. I'm not going back to any of those books I'm not even going to Brother Brownlow's book, Why Am I a Member of the Church of Christ? I'm not even going there. I'm going back to the Bible. Don't go back to Bill. And Don doesn't want you to follow him. He wants you to follow the Scriptures. My friends, that is what restoration is all about. The concept of restoration about these men, we can tell stories, we can talk about them all night long. But the bottom line is this, you and I come back to the Bible to restore our lives. The New Testament Christianity. That's what I preach. That's what I want to teach. Oh, am I interested in these men? Does it thrill me to, to read about them? Does it give me courage? Does it spur me on sometimes? Yes. I encourage you to read about them. Get all the biographies you can. Read them. It will encourage you. It will make you sad sometimes. But you'll be encouraged. Because of the great struggles they went through, you and I can say, well, if they could go through that, I surely can. And you know something? You will. And you'll have to. So we need to continue to restore New Testament Christianity in our lives every day of our lives. And sometimes we'll have to restore congregations 
to where they need to be if we possibly can do that. Could be you're here tonight and you haven't obeyed the gospel. You haven't picked up the word of God. You haven't been baptized for the remission of your sins after you repented of them. You've not confessed Christ before man. You can do that tonight and God will add you to his church, his one church. The one church we've been talking about. Could be you're here tonight and you're a member of the Lord's kingdom. But you haven't lived as a Christian. You can turn your life around tonight. We want you to do that before it's eternally too late. So we want to at this time stand and offer an invitation to those that will come to our Lord. Would you come as we stand and as we sing? Oh.